Okay, so understanding the mechanism is quite simple. Think about what we have just talked about a few minutes ago, is that there is a trade-off involved between holding currency and, or holding money and holding bonds. There are benefits associated with holding money, but there are also other benefits associated with holding bonds. And effectively, what you do is when the benefits of holding one goes up, you shift your assets more in that direction. So as the benefits of holding bonds, which is interest rate, is going up, you shift more your assets towards bonds. But when the benefits is going down, which is when interest rate is going down, you shift more your assets in the other direction towards holding money. The problem is, uh, suppose this I2 level of interest rate. This is a very low interest rate. And if interest rates, uh, the, the word I used was uh, lower bound. So there is a lower bound for interest rate, which isn't zero, but it's still a very low rate of interest and people will not accept an interest rate which is less than this. Because notice that when you put your money as bonds, there are some costs associated. It's like you have to get a broker, a financial advisor, let's say, and that guy is going to charge you some money. Every time he does something for you, there's going to be a fee associated with it. So, for example, it's usually lower than this, but suppose your financial advisor charges you 1% interest every time he does something for you. So suppose you want him to take 100 taka that you have and invest this 100 taka that you have as currency and invest this in as bonds. So what he is going to do is for the service that he is providing to you, he is going to charge you 1%. So out of 100 taka, he is going to take away 1%. He is going to keep one taka for himself and he's going to invest 99 taka for you. Now, when will you be willing to invest your money as bonds when you can earn more than this one taka through interest so if you have like five six seven percent interest in the bond market that's good enough you don't mind paying this one percent broker's charge or financial advisor's charge because you're earning more money from the bond market but suppose the interest is 0 0.5 percent are you going to be willing to put any money as bond? Not really, because the cost of investing is higher than how much money you make. So suppose this I2 that we have, suppose that is one, uh, not this, is 1%, which means that since your cost this, that is known as uh, transaction cost. Since your transaction cost is 1%, you need the interest on bond to be at least 1%. If the interest on bond is less than 1%, you actually lose money by investing in bonds. So you will just hold everything as cash. And as long as the interest rate is more than 1%, you're happy enough to invest as bond. So liquidity trap occurs when we reach this lower bound. As the government continues to increase the money supply, the interest rate continues to fall and it falls until the lower bound. In this case, in our example, that's 1%. So interest rate is 1% and it cannot go below this. 
So the government can increase the money supply as much as they want, but interest rate will not fall any further. The reason this is bad is because, remember this, when the government is trying to regulate the economy, they use monetary policy to increase or decrease the interest rate. And what this effectively does is it determines how much money we have in hand that affects our aggregate demand and aggregate supply and how much goods is produced in the economy. And that may have implications for how much jobs are created and how much money people are making, et cetera, et cetera. So monetary policy is very important. It's one of the most important tools that the government have in trying to regulate the economy. But once we get stuck in a liquidity trap, monetary policy is no longer useful. It's, uh, monetary policy is no longer effective and the government can no longer regulate the economy through monetary policy. And that's why the liquidity trap is bad. Uh, so one thing I should say is that this diagram is different in the book. In the book, what you will see is something like this. Money, I, this is the, okay, let me use a different ink. So in the book, this is the money demand. And now we have a money supply. So effectively, once, what I've talked about is a lower bound. Uh, what the book talks about is a zero lower bound. The difference between these two explanations, effectively they talk about the same phenomena of a point where monetary supply, uh, monetary policy is no longer effective, but the difference between the two explanation is that I'm talking about a case where there is a transaction cost involved. And so if the interest rate is less than transaction cost, no one wants to buy bonds anymore. As a result, the interest rate can't fall below the transaction cost. And that is a lower bound. In the book, we have a zero lower bound because think about it, interest rate can never be less than zero. Interest rate cannot be minus 2%. So interest rate has a zero lower bound. Uh, what the book explanation ignores is transaction cost. It assumes that the economy has no transaction cost. Now, that's a simpler example than the one that I have provided. And for this course, I will accept both explanation. So I will accept the zero lower bound and also the a positive number lower bound explanation. They're both effectively the same thing. The only difference is that in the book explanation, there is one additional simplifying assumption and that is that there is no transaction cost. And in the example that I did, I have not made that assumption but they're both fine.